Tisztelt Hölgyeim és Uraim! Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to welcome you all on the Vivin Day Lose event series and the third, third iteration of our event series about Stupor Tuesday, Decision Day, that's the title of today's event. But first of all, uh, I would like to give the floor to Peter Törcsi, the operative director of the Center for Fundamental Rights to hold his opening speech. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation for today's event. There is this uh, not really nice joke about the U.S. that, uh, uh, that the U.S. Uh, exported so much democracy uh, during uh, the democratic uh, administration that none is left for the U.S. itself. But um, happily, it seems that it's not quite true because the Supreme, Supreme Court, uh, Court made a decision uh, about a progressive scheme whether someone can be removed from the ballot. And uh, finally, it seems that Donald Trump can stay on the ballot based on the decision. Uh, of the Supreme Court. So the rule of law actually was restored and actually it was strengthened. And I think this is uh, truly a, a turning point when it comes to woke leftist uh, forces and how they tried to undermine in the Western countries and in the US the rule of law standards which are important for a candidate to start uh, in, in an election. And uh, it's also important that it was a unanimous decision from conservative and liberal uh, members of the court. Uh, so this is actually uh, crossing out one element of the cancel culture uh, so it's, uh, it's an important decision for the democracy of the U.S. and it's an important message uh, for the progressives who are not uh, recognizing the 100 years old traditions uh, of democracy in the U.S. Another important event uh, was the Super Tuesday had organized this week, which is one of the central uh, events of uh, the primaries where they hold uh, uh, primaries in 15 states in the US. And uh, Donald Trump managed uh, to win uh, by 70 uh, percentage points in some countries. There was only one uh, state, uh, Vermont, where uh, Nikki Haley managed to win. And uh, Vermont uh, is the state of Bernie Sanders. Uh, who is even, you know, to the left compared to the Hungarian socialists as well. So probably that explains Nikki Haley winning in that state. And that's important uh, for the Americans because now uh, it's quite clear after Nikki Haley stepping back that uh, Donald Trump is going to be the candidate. Uh, and uh, the never Trumpers, uh, such as uh, uh, the uh, head of the Senate, already indicated that they are supporting Trump now. And Nikki Haley only said that uh, Trump uh, has to do something to, uh, to earn the support of Nikki Haley. But it seems that the voters in the US made a decision here. And that's important for us in Hungary because uh, now it's quite clear from the Republican side at least uh, that Trump is going to be the candidate of the Republicans. And uh, it will be decided, of course, in Wisconsin, in the Republican, in front of the Republican committee, where they are making the official decision uh, who is going to be the candidate of the Republican Party. But it's now clear that it's going to be Donald Trump. Why is it important? Why this is important for us? It's important, of course, for the Americans, because they need a strong leader with a clear vision uh, about the US and the future of the US. 
And for us, as a proud ally of the U.S., it's quite important who is sitting in the White House because we see that uh, uh, there is great turmoil uh, around the world uh, when it comes to the Russian attack on Ukraine, uh, the terrorist attack of Hamas against Israeli citizens. There is turmoil in the Middle East once again. And what we see in the U.S. and, and in Europe, no matter how rich the Western world is, no matter the recovery in, of the economy in the Western world, there is a lack of, um, let's say, power and force in the U.S. administration and in the European leadership as well. And this uh, means uh, that also means that in June we can uh, replace our representation in the EU as well. And uh, the U.S. Uh, right protects the families. Uh, the U.S. right is against uh, illegal migra migration and uh, the Vogue culture and gender ideology. And uh, they want order to return to the world. But for order, you need uh, power and strength. And for us, uh, as part of NATO and the Western Alliance, uh, we, we shouldn't expect uh, order outside, coming from outside uh, the Western world, from, from the East, for example. We need strong leadership in the U.S. Uh, and strong leadership in the EU because uh, our mission is to dominantly organize uh, the, the, the life of the world. Uh, so that uh, other superpowers should uh, should be respectful uh, towards uh, our Western alliance. This doesn't necessarily mean this doesn't mean that uh, we should intervene with weapons. It, it means that uh, we should show strength, and we hope that first of all Trump uh, will uh, win uh, the elections and uh, under. Uh, a new conservative leadership in the White House. There is going to be a conservative force and power which brings uh, peace and prosperity around the world. And our colleagues are going to talk about the details of this. I would like to thank uh, Dan Schneider for accepting our invitation. Uh, thank you very much for coming to Budapest and uh, I wish you a, a fruitful conversation and hopefully we can talk uh, about the details. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much for your words, Mr. Director, for the introductory thoughts. And I would like to respectfully ask Dan Schneider, the Vice President of the MRC Free Speech America, to come up on stage and take his seat. And my colleague, Zoltan Koshkovic who's going to be the moderator of the discussion, and he's the geopolitical research analyst of the Center for Fundamental Rights, and please enjoy the fruitful discussion. Appears to be on. <coughs> Hello, welcome, and uh, thank you for coming to our third uh, primary season uh, discussion uh, concerning the American election year. It is a fantastic, uh, very important year. And this is a, a wonderful day, I believe, because uh, we can uh, declare a, a provisional victory. Donald Trump has indeed become the Republican nominee today. Am I getting anything wrong, Dan, or can we just say that I'll try? I think technically we're supposed to say he is the presumptive nominee. Uh, you know, he'll become the formal nominee uh, in July with the, the Republican convention. Yes. Uh, Nikki Haley has stepped down. She dropped out of the race. Uh, with uh, that, it remains only a formality until Donald Trump indeed does become uh, the official nominee of the Republican Party. Uh, we ask everybody this question, and I know it's not an easy question, and uh, it's basically we are 50-50 on this, but do you think that uh, it is Joe Biden who is running against Donald Trump? Uh, it is absolutely not Joe Biden who's actually the, functioning as president of the United States. It's not Joe Biden who is functionally the candidate for president of the United States. Uh, with the, the Democrat Party, it's, 
it's a broad swath of individuals who really represent the power and the strategy. There's a, it, Joe Biden is the face of the president. Um, but as such, it's really his decision whether he runs for president, whether he appears to be the <laughs> candidate for president. Well, uh, he's walking or staggering towards uh, November the 5th, uh, not so much running. And clearly there's a lot of pressure among Democrats now to try to get him out of the, that front seat. But he stays, he, he remains very determined to be the nominee. Uh, a week ago, I would have said, I think it's likely he will not end up being the nominee. nominee. But I think I'm, I'm back to what I originally believed, that he will be the face of the party, even though he will not be the brains behind the candidacy or the presidency if he were to win again. Yeah. We're going to return to that question, I think, because there's a lot to explore there, including potential alternatives and the role of Kamala Harris. But let's uh, go from what we know this week. Uh, the week started, uh, well, rather badly for Donald Trump when he found out that he lost uh, the D.C. primary to, to Nikki Haley. Were you surprised that uh, people in Washington, D.C. actually preferred uh, the former U.N. ambassador over Donald Trump? No, I, th I think that uh, I'll disagree with you. I don't think that was bad news for him at all. Um, it wasn't until just a few decades ago that the District of Columbia, which of course is not a state in America, uh, a, few, a few decades ago was given authority to grant delegates. But the, the District of Columbia is a far left city, uh, just like Vermont is a far left state. Uh, and as Peter said, uh, Vermont is even to the left of, of where so, so socialists are today. So frankly, it's a bit of an embarrassment for Nikki Haley that she won DC and Vermont and nothing else. It, it really reflects that the source of her political support was not within mainstream republicanism or conservatism, but really on the left. She basically, she somehow managed to survive the humiliation of winning DC, but when she saw that Vermont also voted for her, she just collapsed and said, that's it. I mean, she was destroyed in every yeah. state. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and, and she has run out of money. Yes. In the end, she, she had some big political and financial supporters who, who abandoned her and she had no money left. All right. Also Monday, uh, we found out that the United States remains a democracy where the rule of law reigns supreme. Uh, and the Supreme Court indeed in a, in a sweeping 9-0 decision basically reprimanded the democratic elites who tried to weaponize the, the judicial system against uh, Donald Trump. Are they are still trying to, but at least on the issue of uh, removing Trump's name from the ballots, that has been settled, if I understand correctly, and uh, Donald Trump will be on the ballots on November the 5th, right? Yeah, what we saw in Colorado and in some other states as well, in Illinois, efforts by, frankly, fairly low-level political appointees or uh, elected officials to remove Donald Trump from the ballot, to prohibit people in their own states from voting for Donald Trump, it was, frankly, shocking to me they did so on the basis that, that they claimed that Donald Trump was an insurrectionist based on what happened at the US Capitol on January 6th, um, three and a half years ago. But in a, in a, if the rule of law is to mean anything, then anybody accused of any wrongdoing has to have what's referred to as due process. Donald Trump has never been accused in a court of law of being an insurrectionist. We've seen these, these left-wing, politicized prosecutors who have tried to indict Donald Trump on various grounds. Never has he been indicted as an insurrectionist, so obviously never adjudicated an insurrectionist. Yet that was the basis that these other political appointees in other states tried to get him removed without due process of law. Which is absurd. And uh, if I remember correctly, the second impeachment was about January 6th insurrection and the impeachment trial in the Senate specifically found him not guilty 
of this. Well, okay. You're right, but let me make a, a, a critical distinction. Uh, when somebody is impeached in the United States, it's the U.S. House of Representatives, after a hearing, there was no hearing. Mm -hmm. Nancy Pelosi did not bring a hearing. There was no evidence ever presented. And so it was a show vote to impeach him. And then, of course, it went to the Senate where there's supposed to be a trial. Uh, but there was, again, no trial. Uh, there was just a vote, you know, and of course that vote failed. But th that was all just politics. Again, lacking any due process at all for the accused. Yes, uh, well, one such uh, legal challenge has been thrown out, uh, but there are others that remain. There are several trials against Donald Trump. I been, believe he has been accused of 91 felonies or something like that. Basically, every one of the accusations is made up. There are several court procedures going on. One in Georgia is, has exceptionally horrid details when it comes to the person of the prosecutor. Uh, the others are stalled. Uh, do you think that any of these uh, processes will amount to a trial before uh, the election? Yeah, Zoltan, y y you are obviously a well-read and very intelligent man. <laughs> you are correctly summarizing many of the things. Uh, Donald Trump has been accused of made-up charges. That is, that is true. When you look at what the attorney in the District of Columbia has accused Donald Trump of. It's based on a theory, not on criminal law, but on a theory of what is wrong and what is right. The only case that is brought against Donald Trump based on actual law is whether he um, maintained top secret you know, documents after he left the presidency. In his garage? I'm sorry? In his garage? It, then, oh, no, no, that that's, was the, that's, other, that's guy the other guy who did that, who was cleared of any wrongdoing for doing the exact same thing. Which, and, and I've served a, a Republican president in the past. Uh, it is quite common for presidents to maintain records, uh, some of which are also classified, to, to indict Donald Trump on maintaining records is absurd. Factually, it's the only accusation based on actual law that a president is not supposed to maintain these records, but every single president has done what Donald Trump has been indicted for. Plus, if I uh, understand correctly, a president can declassify documents at any time, uh, at any time. when he is in office? Yeah, so. any time. It, it's the president's sole decision what gets declassified, yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, are, are we going to see a trial before November, do you think? No. Uh, and this, this, of course, is my opinion, my prediction. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court seven days ago uh, granted certiorari. The Supreme Court will hear the case um, whether Donald Trump is immune from prosecution in the District of Columbia based on the fact that he used to be president. This is really interesting to me. Um, I do not believe that under U.S. law, that a former president maintains that immunity from prosecution. But what is so clear to any objective observer is that the US courts, prosecutors, and certain judges have been so politicized that they are using their power illegally to try to silence Donald Trump and to prevent him from being on the ballot. I think our U.S. Supreme Court has recognized that what is going on is extrajudicial, outside of what judges are really allowed to do, and outside the prosecutorial system, that they have granted certiorari, in essence, to stop the prosecution of Donald Trump before he's declared the nominee. So I think that a decision will come down in two to three months saying that Donald Trump is not immune from prosecution, but at that point, we will be too close to the election, and the prosecutor will not be allowed to go forward you know, with this trial until after the election is over. <clears throat> Great. Uh, I would not have uh, expected the liberal judges on the Supreme Court to 
side with this uh, ruling, but but uh, to their credit, democracy is more important to them than ideology. Well, the right that was on the, the whether Trump could be on the ballot. It, 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 that abuse was so obvious. I, I did expect a nine to zero ruling in favor of Donald Trump. It, it we cannot allow individuals to upend democracy. And that's what was going on in Colorado and Illinois. Uh, staying with the Supreme Court, but moving on also to, to the media landscape in the United States, uh, were you surprised at all by the reaction in the mainstream press to this uh, 9-0 to zero, uh, ruling? They, they basically started uh, screaming, as, as, as is typical from uh, the left these days, that this is unfair. This is No, I was, I was not surprised at all, because our media has ceased to function like journalists a long time ago. The media today in America, broadly speaking, uh, are just arms of the left, arms of the Democrat Party. Uh, journalists today, so-called journalists, uh, get their talking points from the Democrat Party. They are advocates and allies for politicians on the left. Uh, and of course, we see that when they purport to run stories about Viktor Orban and about uh, other conservative leaders around the world, whether it's Jair Bolsonaro, um, uh, or the other leaders. Uh, uh, there are some excellent leaders in, in Italy and in the Netherlands, uh, but the U.S. media will always attack them you know, and, and accuse them of all sorts of terrible things. Yes, Georgia Maloney was a fascist, I remember. Uh, yeah, this, this is a trend. Uh, but are we talking about media in general, or is this more like mainstream legacy media? So I don't use the term uh, mainstream media. Yeah, legacy media, corporate media politicized media, but ABC, NBC, CBS, the, the New York Times, the Washington Post, you know, these, these media outlets that have been the, the dominant provider of information, I don't even want to call it news anymore, mm -hmm. the dominant provider of their version of facts, their version of information, you know, these are the advocates against conservatism, uh, the, the political operatives functioning within the media today. And we see that in, in uh, the United States, but we also see that in Europe. I think the, the swamp creatures in Brussels as well as in Washington have long tentacles. Do you see this as an alignment of interest between leftist politicians and uh, the legacy media, or is this somehow coordinated? Um, I don't believe that these politicians and the career bureaucrats and the media meet secretly to, to set up a strategy. They don't need to meet secretly. They have the same goals. And that, so they function almost like a choir without a conductor, but whether you're the violin player or you're the, the, the clarinet player, you know your role, yeah. you know your part, and they play pretty well together. Even without a conductor telling them the score and the beat and the rhythm, they do what they do very well. Hey, if you ever went to a pub and listened to ch some rock musicians just jamming, you, you, you know that, that musicians can do that and, and the political actors can do that as well. And that is what I think is happening in here in Europe and across the pond uh, in the United States as well. Uh, they have immense scary power, and we saw that uh, four years ago during the last presidential elections. The Hunter Biden laptop story is basically the, the par excellence example of uh, such influence. They made, made that story disappear until after the elections, basically. Uh, what can we do against such overwhelming power, and have we made inroads in, in weakening them? Well, it's, it's not just legacy media, it's also big tech. Yeah. And it, yeah, with the, the release of the Twitter files, uh, the world has discovered th how big tech was collaborating with Joe Biden, his administration, and you know, the FBI. Pe people in the, in the deep state. Uh, and of course, in America, if you talk about the deep state, these federal bu bureaucrats, some will say that you're a conspiracy theorist. I find that laughable. I worked in the executive branch as a political appointee. I was battling radicalized left-wing career employees all the time. This is what they do. Uh, and big tech, especially Google, 
is trying to bury conservatives at every level. Let me just give you one example. Uh, we, we had an, you know, different Republican presidential debates. When we Googled Republican presidential campaign websites, again, right before the presidential debates, Republican presidential debates, only two websites were returned as search results. Marianne Williamson, who is a Democrat, polling at 2%, and the only other campaign website was Will Hurd, who was a Republican polling at 0%. But Donald Trump's website did not present Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy. No other Republican showed up. When you did the same search for Democrats, the number one search result was Joe Biden. Google is intentionally burying information about conservatives. It's intentionally swaying public opinion toward the left. It's doing this at, at, every, uh, at every avenue. Last week, of course, the world got to see this on display when you tried to find a picture of the Pope and you had a black woman show up as the Pope. Uh, but this is what Google is doing, and Google is especially bad. So would you recommend uh, our listeners to switch search engines? Uh, because I fear that not many people will agree to use Explorer. That's not happening. Well, my wife has, is doing research on uh, some, some issues relating to Israel. And she has stopped using the Google search engine because in trying to find information and in articles, it's only giving a left-wing pro-Hamas search result. Whereas when she uses Bing she finds far more articles that are useful for her research. Uh, Tusk is another alternative. Um, but while, while Bing and DuckDuckGo are still controlled by people on the left, they're much more fair than what Google is presenting. What about Yahoo? And uh, That's the only alternative that comes to my mind. Which one is that? Yahoo. Yahoo. Yahoo you know, it used to be the most popular one before Yes, Google. yeah. So uh, anything is better than Google. <clears throat> so, uh, as we've uh, mentioned, we well, let's return to the actual race in November between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, if it is indeed Joe Biden. Um, for, Hungarian, for Hungarians, this is a distant thing. The American election is obviously important. We have a war right next door, and uh, the Biden administration is heavily involved in that war, even if there are no uh, American foots, uh, boots on the ground. But it's still, we understand here that how important an American election still is. But they don't spend too much time of their day uh, just researching candidates. What they most often see on uh, television is basically Joe Biden. And I think it's a uniform opinion here in Hungary that Joe Biden is not in a condition to run for election, never mind run a country. Uh, so let's try to uh, explore the reasons why the Democrats have him as their candidate. Well, he was selected by the leadership of the Democrat Party five and a half years ago um, because the other... Uh, the candidates who were running for president then against Joe Biden in the primary, Bernie Sanders was polling by far the best, but the American public did not like his socialist views. The, the Democrat primary voter did, and the Democrat Party realized that Bernie Sanders was going to win the nomination unless they intervened and prevented him from getting it. Uh, so basically the Democrat Party hand-selected Joe Biden because he appeared to be the most moderate, appeared to be the most centric of all the Democrats running. It doesn't matter who is selected by the Democrats to be their nominee. It's the, it's the machinery behind that person who runs everything. That's why we see a radicalized administration doing terrible things that not only hurt Americans, but hurt people all over the world. You know, Vladimir Putin did not invade a single country, did not take any additional territory while Donald Trump was president. China was not directly threatening Taiwan. The economy in the U.S. and elsewhere was stable and strong. You can tick through all of these things. Hamas, of course, was not invading Israel while, while Donald Trump was president. We did not have books in public schools talking about transgenderism 
and teaching eight-year-olds about homosexual sex. We now have a society that's been corrupted by the radical left, an economy that's been destroyed, and, and a national security system that is threatening peace all over the globe, all because we have radicals running countries like, like in America and elsewhere. The sad thing about this is that the radical that is responsible for this is not necessarily Joe Biden. I, a lot of us think that he is no longer responsible for anything, in, including uh, <clears throat> Robert Hart. Who, who wrote uh, in his opinion on whether or not to launch proceedings against Joe Biden over the uh, misplaced the confidential materials, that documents that, that he would not be able to, not mentally fit to uh, stand trial. So, uh, but if it's not uh, Joe Biden, it almost doesn't matter if they replace him and then if they re do replace him, then with whom? Is that the case? If the Democrat Party decides that he is unable to win in this next general election. They will do everything they can to replace him. Um, Gretchen Whitmer would be an attractive candidate for them. Governor from Michigan. Governor from Michigan. Uh, it'll be, you know, with the Democrats, everything is about intersectionality. It's not about substance. It's about, it's about checking off enough boxes. And you know, Gretchen Whitmer uh, checks off a couple of the boxes that they need and is somebody that, uh, could have appeal broadly in America. So I would see them l looking to somebody like Gretchen Whitmer. Others say that the governor of California would be a better candidate. He certainly has sort of movie star looks and, and movie star hair, but California is in such disarray. It, it, it's probably the worst state in the country now in terms of wokeness and what's going on with the economy and its own border. And Californians are leaving um, so yeah. And also, he's a middle-aged white guy, which doesn't check too many boxes in my book. It doesn't check too many boxes, but he's pretty radical. So the, the radical element of the Democrat Party would probably be okay with him if he were selected to be their candidate. I have to ask you about Michelle Obama because everybody's talking about that. I don't believe that she wants to run at all. What do you think? So let me say this about her, and I don't mean this as a character flaw, and I also do not mean this as a joke. She doesn't like people. It's very difficult to be a popular politician if you do not like people, but she does not like interacting with people. She does not like meeting with people. She does not interact with people. I mean, think of it. When was the last time you actually saw her speaking to an audience, not just a reporter, but to a, to a group of people? and engaging with them. She just doesn't do that. She supposedly wrote a book, but that was obviously ghostwritten, as most of these books are, yes. On the other hand, uh, think about it. She's been surrounded by politicians and journalists for the last 20 years. I mean, I can understand if she's had enough of people. She has really kept her distance from, uh, from politicians uh, and from the media, really. Uh, hand-picked moments, but she has been very quiet, and she's been behind the scenes. So, I, no, I don't think that she'll be the nominee. Uh, we have to talk about Kamala Harris as well. Uh, <laughs> not, not, not a favorite topic of anybody, but she is the vice president currently. She is a heartbeat and not a very hard, healthy heartbeat away from the presidency. Nobody is mentioning her as potentially replacing uh, Joe Biden, although that would be the natural thing after all. She served as second in command for four years. Why not just let her? Well, everybody knows that she has disliked uh, her own staff. People who work directly for her dislike her very much. She cannot keep staff. They quit uh, because she's a very disagreeable person uh, who is not knowledgeable about facts, uh, is an embarrassment to the, to the administration in which she serves. Everybody understands she's an empty suit. Uh, would she be popular with the voters? No. No, she's very unpopular. She's, you know, Joe Biden's popularity is terrible. Hers is even worse. I mean, it's really, it's perplexing how in America the president and vice president of the United States are the two most unpopular politicians in the whole country. 
It's amazing. I remember that she was given the task of solving the uh, uh, crisis on the southern border in the first year of <laughs> Joe Biden's presidency. How is she doing? She's doing as well at that as she is addressing the, the fentanyl drug abuse problem in America, as she is overseeing uh, artificial intelligence policy. You know, she's been oh, assigned yeah. to be the czar of several things, and she has done nothing on any of these things. Uh, and if anybody doubts uh, that uh, Kamala Harris cannot possibly win any election, basically they should, should just not Google Bing Kamala laughing. <laughs> just, just watch that for 30 seconds. Uh, well, <clears throat> in that case, uh, the Democrats are really uh, stuck uh, with Joe Biden. And uh, that's what's going to happen. Let me just raise one thing. In the primaries, the Republicans have one set of rules. Democrats have a completely different set of rules. Republicans are bound to have a nominee who wins the most delegates. Democrats not only have regular delegates, but then what they call superdelegates. So it doesn't, in some respects, it really doesn't matter how many delegates Joe Biden wins during the Democrat primaries. In the end, the Democrat Party leaders can hand-select somebody with a little bit of, of twists and turns, but nothing is guaranteed for Joe Biden. It, it would be very difficult to replace him, but they could. Well, Barack uh, Obama and Hillary Clinton are super delegates, say, if I guess correctly. Uh, I think many of these super delegates are secret. Are secret. Yeah, it's, this is That's the back the business of politics. The best kind of chinovnik is the secret chinovnik. That's uh, how they decide. Uh, how long can they hope to get away with this? Uh, I mean, uh, we all see in Europe as well as North America that politics is changing. A more populist approach to doing business is coming back here as well as in North America. The uh, Democrat organization of uh, political power is unsustainable in this political environment. How much longer can, can they do this? Well, here's the trick. Democrats in America have governed in one way, but spoken in a different way. Uh, when Barack Obama was president, he always talked about building an economy for the middle class, but his policies did the opposite. And it was very clear. But the media, as an ally of Barack Obama and now Joe Biden, will cover for them. How long will the American public be duped by this? Duped by a media that conceals the truth? I think, I hope, the public is starting to wake up to this. You know, trust, you know, the polling shows that trust in the media is in decline and trust in big tech is in decline. So I do hope the American public will, will be curious enough to look for real news, real information, and have access to it. Then you are the vice president of the Media Research Center, uh, so you are best placed to know. What would you recommend uh, to our audience? Where do they go for real news? Mm. I have different reporters uh, that I like to follow uh, and read. Uh, when it comes to legal analysis, I think really one of the best is Andy McCarthy uh, with National Review. He is not a fan of Donald Trump. You're not going to get pro-Trump analysis from Andy McCarthy. You're going to get solid legal analysis from Andy McCarthy. Um, other reporters, uh, Dave Marcus is very good. Um, to get a sense of where Americans really are on issues. You know, this is getting past just the talking points of candidates and getting a sense of where, uh, where Americans, how they're thinking today about, about issues. Are there any new media journalists or, or influencers that you follow? Yes. Uh, uh, in addition to Dave Marcus and Andy McCarthy, uh, at The Federalist, uh, Molly Hemingway is excellent. Um, uh, Ted Cruz has a podcast, uh, Senator Ted Cruz, yeah. and that podcast is excellent. It's, it's very entertaining. Yes, it's entertaining, <laughs> and you're getting the news before it happens. He's going to tell you what the news will be in the Senate in two days' time. You get to be an insider in how government works when you listen to his podcast. 
I know a lot of huge things happened this week in the United States, but for the bilateral relationship, the American-Hungarian relationship, the most important thing is still yet to come. Uh, Prime Minister Viktor Orban is uh, visiting the United States, and he will meet... Uh, We agreed to switch places. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Well, thank you for agreeing yeah, to that. Anytime. <laughs> And he's going to meet with uh, now nominee uh, Donald Trump uh, on Friday. What do you think they're going to discuss? Huh. My hope is that Donald Trump will get good advice from Viktor Orban. Um, Viktor Orban has been a strong leader who's also understood that his leadership resides in the strength of the people behind him. Uh, Donald Trump, I think, could learn from that um, and try to have a broader appeal. That's what I hope the conversation will be about. How important do you think it is for these uh, two, I, I think I can call them champions of of conservatism, to meet in uh, uh, a election super year like 2024 is with four billion people voting uh, worldwide? The world is in chaos. Freedom is in decline. The idea of both individual freedom and national sovereignty is being attacked by the George Soros crowd, uh, you know, the, the, the supranational organizations like the, the European Union, uh, big corporate power, like, like the big tech, where the four largest technology companies of the world dwarf anything that has existed before. If you look at the, the market capitalization of the four biggest big tech companies uh, tra publicly traded today, they exceed the gross national product of almost every country on the planet except for China and the United States. Their power is immense, and that power being used against individuals is going to destroy freedom on the planet and national sovereignty. So I think the most important thing that can come of Donald Trump and Viktor Orban talking is figuring out how to restore freedom, democracy, the rule of law, national sovereignty, uh, and how the way to promote peace best on this planet is by having countries be strong and not subservient to these supranational entities. So uh, there's uh, Prime Minister Orban in Hungary, already in power. Giorgio Maloney in Italy was elected recently Prime Minister. And the entire conservative world erupted in joy when they found out that Milei was uh, elected Argentina. Are we looking at brighter days? And does this mean that Donald Trump is a shoe-in in November? Uh, well, nothing's a shoe-in in November. Uh, but Javier Milei ran on policies and values to turn Argentina around. And he is making good on those promises. The people of Argentina will shortly see that the ideas of freedom and national sovereignty are good for them. I and and George, what Giorgio Maloney is doing in Italy, very similar. And I think the people of Central and South America will see a shining light on a hill with Javier Malay. Same with Europe and Giorgio Maloney. But we've, we've seen that leadership provided uh, by Viktor Orban for quite some time. My hope is that these are the catalysts to restore freedom around the globe. One of the uh, things that uh, they're bound to discuss uh, in Mar-a-Lago, uh, Mr. Trump and Mr. Orban, is the security situation in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ukraine war, obviously very important for Hungary as it's in the neighborhood, but also the tragedy that uh, is unfolding in the Middle East and the piracy that is happening on the Red Sea. Uh, these are major issues. And of course, none of these happened under Donald Trump's leadership. And I think we all assumed that they wouldn't have happened had Donald Trump uh, remained in the White House. But things have changed, and things uh, the problems have gotten deeper. Are you confident that Donald Trump can fix these conflicts and, uh, as uh, Prime Minister Orban says, bring peace to the world? Well, one thing that is so important to keep in mind is that Iran is at the center of all of this. And uh, with terrible leadership coming from both Washington and Brussels, Iran has been allowed to develop its nuclear uh, 
capability for armed conflict. That just cannot be unwound. That's not just a policy change. That is a reality that has to be addressed. What do we do with a nuclearized power like Iran that has promised to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, followed by wiping America off the face of the earth? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Putin has taken advantage of, of what's going on in Iran to create turmoil around the globe, supporting Syria, supporting Hamas. Uh, so it's going to be a challenge for the next uh, round of leaders to address. It's going to be tough. Donald Trump is going to have a firm ally in Hungary uh, as he moves towards peace. Uh, we cannot uh, miss the opportunity to talk about CPEC. Dan is one of the founding fathers of not just CPEC Hungary, but international CPECs in general. How did that idea come about? What prompted you to start thinking about taking CPEC to the global stage? I'll be honest. It was not my in- initial idea. I was appro- uh, approached by a friend in Japan who asked if he could launch CPEC in Japan. And I spent three years working with him uh, before we launched J.I.E.B.A. 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 Yes. Uh, and uh, that turned out to be very successful. I was then approached by... Uh, Andrew Cooper in Australia who wanted to do the same and that was very successful and I started to be approached by many others. I'll tell you that when it came to many, many people throughout Europe wanted to be the first to launch CPAC in Europe and I had to be very selective. I wanted to make sure that, that CPAC was launched both by an organization and in a country where it really would have an impact. Uh, And after doing due diligence and thorough research, it became very clear to me that Hungary was the right place to launch CPAC in Europe and that the Center for Fundamental Rights, being the premier legal think tank uh, in this country, was that they were the right partner for this. And I'm very pleased with what has happened uh, as a consequence. Thank you so much. So this is going to be this year, our third annual CPAC Hungary from April 25th to 26th. We are still in conversation with Dan, but I personally very much hope that he will be able to make it because he really should be there. It's a fantastic uh, event. Uh, we need some woke busters who can drain the swamp in Europe and in, in Brussels and in Washington, don't you think? <laughs> we do, we do. Thank you so much, Dan. It was great to have you here Thank you. again.